Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another uh, webinar of the KLSCH uh, webinar series. Uh, my name is Yi Yi. Uh, I am my, your moderator for the evening. Uh, today, our webinar titled First XPM Jailed for Corruption, Malaysia's Milestone. Uh, this webinar would be about the recent, uh, the consequences of the recent uh, uh, verdict of the Najib Razak trial. So back in July 2020, uh, former Prime Minister Najib Razak, he was convicted guilty by a lower court of the judiciary, mainly on the embezzlement for fraudulently obtaining around 42 million ringgit from SRC International, an ex-1MDB fund subsidiary. The scandal has exposed Corrupt officials and financial institutions worldwide spurred the U.S. Department of Justice to open what becomes its biggest kleptocracy investigation. Uh, and Najib, who faces several trials over these allegations, uh, he, can, he kept denying wrongdoing. So in the same month of July 2020, the High Court convicted Najib on seven counts. This includes one count of power abuse, three counts of criminal breach of trust, three of money laundering, and these each sentenced to 10 years in prison. And all sentences will be executed concurrently. Najib faces 12 years in prison in total and a fine of 210 million ringgit. So finally, on August 23rd, uh, 2022, uh, Chief Justice Tengku Maimun declared that the court gave the defense time to argue, counter argue, but they declined to do so. So she insisted that High Court Judge Muhammad Naslan uh, correctly found Najib guilty back in July 2020. And therefore, the federal court affirmed Najib's sentence and is sent him to jail. So, as the first Malaysian Prime Minister in Malaysia to be jailed, uh, is Najib's conviction a symbol of transparency? <coughs> Uh, and independence of our just judicial system, and what is the impact of this uh, verdict? How will his conviction affect Malaysia's politics and judiciary? And or is it a lesson for government and opposition politicians to avoid further blunders that cost that can cost billions? So. Um, I would like to introduce our esteemed guest of the evening. We first have Dr. Gurya Singh Nijar. He's a law professor at University of Malaya. And then we have Professor Hamidin. He's a political analysis at University of Malaya. And finally, but not uh, last, Professor Wong Ching Huat. He's a political scientist at Samui University. So, um, I would like to say a big thank you to our media partner this evening, which is Kini TV. And uh, for those uh, who are watching out there, we can also view uh, our webinar on Kini TV, the Facebook page, or um, Professor Wong Chin Huat's Facebook page as well. So uh, with no further ado, uh, I will pass on the mic to the first speaker of the evening, uh, Dr. Gurdial. Uh, Dr. Gurdial, please go ahead. Oh, uh, you might need to mute, unmute. Yes, thank you. Uh, just to uh, start off by correcting a, a small uh, introductory um, gap a bit. I'm not presently a professor at the law faculty. I'm a retired professor from the University of Malaya Law Faculty. Yeah. Now, as far as the topic is concerned, I think I want to make one general preliminary comment. And this is that there is a very serious area of concern with regard to the, in relation to the case and the conviction of the ex prime minister. And that is, there seems to be a direct, since the decision, there seems to be from various quarters, a direct undermining of the authority of the institution of the judiciary. There have been a lot of strident, virulent, 
attacks against the members of the uh, panel which decided this case, in particular the Chief Justice, as well as questioning in rather uh, in, in ways which causes a lot of disquiet. That what is happening is that there is an attempt to erode the authority of the judiciary uh, in the eyes of the public. There seems to be some sort of a concerted effort, at that. and I think this has to be. Uh, a, this is a source of great concern. In fact, it's a danger that looms very large. Now, let me just make four or five very short points in relation to the case itself and its implications. The first point I want to make is actually when we look at the federal court proceedings, the court itself was on trial because the lawyers for uh, Dato Sri Najib were actually challenging the authority of the court to proceed with the case in very strident ways. And therefore, it became really, right from the beginning, a contest between the lawyers of Najib, Dato Sri Najib, and the court itself and its processes. Now, the court is entitled to proceed in the way that it thinks best in accordance with the timetable that has already been set up. But at each go, there were at least four challenges that sought to stymie the proceedings from going ahead. And that leads me to my second point, that which was that there was first an application to introduce fresh evidence on the basis that the high court judge who convicted Dato Sri Najib was conflicted because of his tenure of office in Lane Banking Berhad before he took on his role as a judge. Then there was, uh, after this was rejected, right, and there was written grounds on that, very cogent written grounds on that, on the relevancy of the allegations that were made and the fact that this kind of evidence in any event was available long before uh, the uh, hearing itself. Uh, and in fact, even long before the actual trial itself. Um, so when that was uh, rejected with a written decision, then there was an attempt to say that we need time to prepare and we cannot proceed with this. And despite the fact that the court made it very clear that these applications had previously been refused and urged the lawyers concerned to proceed with submission, there were prevarications. At some stage, they said, oh, yes, we can maybe uh, proceed, but we, be, you know, we can do that by written submissions, or you can rely on the written submissions that were made earlier in the Court of Appeal. So there were a lot of prevarications, but at the end of the day, there was an obdurate, a uh, very clear uh, position that was taken uh, that they had no intention to proceed with the hearing. So that second application then to adjourn was also uh, rejected by the court for good reasons because they said ever since April it has been made clear that this case will proceed. Uh, in fact, I was involved on behalf of the Kuala Lumpur Bar when um, uh, Dr. Sri Najib applied to introduce to have a QC to assist him in the case. Uh, in that case, it was made clear by their own affidavits that they were ready to proceed with the case. It's just that they needed the help of a QC to bolster uh, their uh, submissions in the federal court. And then they applied. When all, the, all that failed, there was an application to discharge themselves. So that was the third application to, uh, to if it, as it was scuttled the uh, court from proceeding with the with the subject matter and when this discharge also was in my respectful view for good reason rejected um, the lawyers concerned still were obdurate they still refused to proceed despite the, the what the court said in their judgment later on was there was a persistent refusal to participate in the proceedings at all and then the final blow, as it were, 
uh, to the court proceedings was when they applied to recuse the chief justice uh, on grounds that uh, you know her husband had some uh, few years earlier posted something in the Facebook, uh, and uh, therefore there was a question of bias when this was also rejected by a written decision based on three clear authorities, one from Australia and two from the United Kingdom, that the, you know, a casual comments made by a spouse does not automatically by itself entitle uh, you to recuse the adjudicator, in this case, the Chief Justice itself. So despite all these court rulings in four of these cases, and they were all based on law, as well as code of ethics, as far as lawyers are concerned, because the, a lawyer cannot take on a case unless he is ready by, his, by the code of ethics that we have for the bar, lawyer's uh, professional code, uh, he must be ready to proceed. Otherwise, you should not take the case on. And there was also a wider interest of administration of justice, which is, you know, the decision, the case was being uh, scheduled for hearing over a large number of days. It is a case of immense public importance, and therefore there's a need for closure on the part of both the accused person as well as the general administration of justice and the prosecution itself. And the third point is then the court very carefully in their final judgments, they can see in the absence of his persistent refusal to participate in the, in the proceedings itself. So there was uh, therefore a very clear basis in law, in practice, in case of the board of ethics, uh, of the profession itself uh, for the court to come to its decision that they will nonetheless proceed and there will there is no question of miscarriage of justice as normally occurs right where a person is not granted the right here the person was urged many times to submit but was uh, very clear in refusing this at all costs whatever happened uh, and therefore to suggest that that would result in the miscarriage of justice when you yourself refuse in the circumstances of the case after having taken on the case um you know knowing of the fact that these proceedings will go on then it is uh, it, it does not qualify in law as a miscarriage of justice now this is, comes back to the main point that i made earlier now it is being presented as though this is a very serious miscarriage of justice ignoring the circumstances in which each of those four applications were pursued and were dealt with by the court in very comprehensive, cogent manner. So this is where I say that the institution of the judiciary is being uh, attacked in a way that is, in my respectful view, uh, just to put it at, at its mildest, entirely inappropriate and grossly unfair to the judiciary itself. And what has to be recognized by the public at large is that, you know, this is a very slippery slope. When you begin to question the authority of uh, adjudicators, of uh, persons who are there to hold an even balance between the prosecution and uh, between a private citizen and the prosecution in criminal cases, when you begin to undermine their authority and question it in a way that undermines the institution itself, the administration of justice itself, then it does irreparable harm to the body politic. Uh, and the constitution and its institutions itself. And this, I think, is something that has uh, got to be borne in mind uh, when we are dealing with this case itself. It's very dangerous. Um, uh, very, danger looms very large in, in this particular context. Then, as far as review and pardon is concerned, I think uh, I will leave that issue for now because we can leave it to question time as to whether there is another further stage that can be taken to deal with this 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 matter uh, as far that it has been suggested that of course after this case is over another member another panel of the federal court uh, can be moved by what they call a review jurisdiction but just to clarify in law this review jurisdiction number one cannot deal cannot upset the merits of the case merits of the case are court federal court has decided very clearly that they have looked into the decision by Justice Naslan and the Court of Appeal 
the High Court and the Court of Appeal and come to the conclusion that there was overwhelming evidence, that there is no basis to challenge it uh, at all, uh, and that the decision, I think, came to more than 200 pages, uh, was very well considered. It considered every aspect, and there's no reason to uh, overturn that particular decision itself. So as far as review is concerned, it cannot touch on the merits. That merits are intact. Only the a review can only be done if there is any uh, procedural impropriety. So the procedural impropriety that probably will be uh, relied upon by the uh, by Dr. Sri uh, Najib and his uh, counsel will be that, oh, there was a miscarriage of justice because we were not given a chance to submit or we were not given enough time to submit. But then, as I have been at pains to point out, and the uh, federal court was at pains to point out, they were they knew what they were getting into. They persistently refused. At some stage, they said, yes, they were prepared to submit the following day. And then they took a different stance when the following day came. So it was all a kind of a, of a, of a, of a, of a drama that was being enacted to, uh, to create perhaps a perception that there, is, there has been a miscarriage of justice. We had 94 grounds. The court actually looked at the 94 grounds, by the way, in the federal court before coming to its conclusion you know, on, the, on affirming the conviction. So review can only be as to the procedure, as to, for example, miscarriage of justice, or they did not give them a chance to be heard, natural justice, but here they were at pains to try to get the lawyers to, to submit. It's only that they wanted their own timetable uh, for the uh, submissions, which the court rightly, as they do for all other cases, refused. And the court, in fact, made their point in their final judgment that Article 8 of the Constitution says that all people should be treated alike. So even though you were a high personage before holding high political office, you are entitled in the same way to the kind of justice that we meted out as the ordinary man. So the person holding the scythe, the gardener who is charged in court will be treated in the same way as, as an ex-prime minister. And that is Article 8, Federal Constitution itself, in which the federal court said they will have to apply in all cases without fear or favor. <clears throat> then the final point is about pardon, but that I will leave it to uh, discussion for later on. I think that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Goodyear, uh, for presenting and summarizing on the federal court's decision. Um, so the next speaker I would like to introduce, uh, Professor Hamidi. Uh, on a political analyst at University of Malaya. Uh, Professor Hamidin, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Yee. Uh, thank you for KLA's uh, SCH for inviting me to be the panel for today, uh, together with uh, Prof. Um, Nihar and also uh, my friends, uh, Professor Chin Huat. I think uh, it's very interesting what happened, uh, I think, uh, a week, almost a week ago. Uh, and I try uh, to discuss and give a point of view from AMNO uh, as a major Malay political party um, uh, response uh, and how are they going to react uh, and, and their reactions in regard to the, to the case. Hist um, history was created, I think, with this case where the first time uh, ex-Prime Minister, ex-President of AMNO, I think, uh, was sent to, to uh, found guilty and sent to jail. And within the context of current political situation, it is very interesting for AMNO because it's not only their past president, even the current president is, is still uh, going through court cases and, and waiting for the decision to be made, even in, in, in this September, uh, 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 coming uh, uh, September. So with that, I think, AMNO is in the position where they never experienced this in history, uh, where the position, uh, in my point of view, their leadership has, uh, is being questioned uh, by, uh, uh, in this case. And at the same time, you can see the reaction of, of AMNO basically is like a, a spoiled kids who didn't get things being done according to their way. That's what happened basically, uh, in my point of view, how AMNO react. Uh, towards the decision. Uh, looking at uh, the, the, the language, 
the narrative uh, within the amno is very much they were they they, they think that uh, datuk sri najib were treated uh, not fairly by the court uh, and the court uh, basically for their eyes keep rejecting any demand by uh, 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 najib and as professor mentioned just now is i think for the layman uh, they not really understand the, the, the how the law works but for them the sentiment where they do feel uh, that they are being victimized najib is being victimized by the court and there is a, a, a bigger a framework that that working towards uh, against uh, najib in, in in that sense and against amno so with that uh, I, i do believe that amno will use uh, more on the sympathy point towards najib uh, to gain more support especially uh, drumming out for their own people to an extent this will get uh, more support from outside amno i doubt so i don't think this will give uh, uh, what happened will give a uh, um, kind of big wave for malay particularly to to go to come back and and support amno i i doubt that that's going to be the case but this is going to be the case where amno will strengthen their own uh, uh, support and to make sure that whatever number that they have maintain with them uh, because of this because of this case that's one thing second thing i think the court uh, decisions uh, at the same time reveal uh, and uh, how amno react towards that also reveal the problem that faced by amno leadership the leadership problem that faced by amno and then uh, you can see the fraction between the putrajaya clan and the court uh, 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 factions becoming bigger and bigger i think widen and become, i think is almost going to be official soon uh, when we look at the matters in fact uh, when i talk to some of the uh, people from amno some of them are not happy when they were called uh, and in a very short notice uh, the night before the judgment was made uh, by 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 the amno uh, 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 leadership because they do feel that uh, showing a very uh, kind of weak point for for amno so with that uh, at the same time looking at how amno react uh, you can see even on, on the last saturday uh, when they have a special meeting where the presidents uh, invite not only the family of najib but also the lawyers to present and to give their uh, account of what happened you can see that's how amno in my point of view going to use that uh, as a as a their weapon to get more sympathy uh, among the people towards towards najib and towards towards amno so with that i do believe that uh, this uh, episode will make leadership issues becoming more and more apparent in within amno so i think you can see the the leadership tussle will will uh, to our extent will will go to public uh, i i'm not sure but i do believe uh, if election were not called soon by ismail sabri uh, i think this will make uh, amno uh, act more aggressively uh, towards the government so with that i think the decision not only uh, pressure uh, amno as a political party but also pressure prime minister as from his own his own party at at the same time but i i think at the same time uh, ismail sabri have a better uh, have a good buffer uh, through the mou and understanding with the opposition party to uh, to dismiss not to dismiss but to delay the call of amno to to have a, a election soon however for amno what happened with najib jailing and what happened with the vacuum of leadership that they are facing i think amno will have some impact especially on leadership in the grassroots level amno strengths is basically in the bahagian in the in the in the uh, in the bahagian level and head of the bahagian uh, normally is the most powerful group within within amno so with najib in, in in jail and and not physically around i think the control of resources with amno will make uh, a lot of uh, this um, head of uh, bagian kind of becoming um, a leaderless and start looking for the new patron and this is where i think 
for you can see the struggle to gain more and more support of the bahagian will uh, will uh, dominate amno struggle in the next uh, couple of weeks especially leading to the leading to the elections obviously uh, uh, the president um, zahid will definitely will use his office where normally the very powerful decisions made by the uh, president to make sure that who will be the candidate for uh, uh, as a, as a as a candidate for general election uh, and this obviously will be used by zahid and and his team to make sure that uh, everything will according to their to their plan however uh, I, i do believe that uh, because of the uh, najib in prison is not being physically around will make a certain group who are aligned with najib will go to uh, other faction soon and this will create uh, a lot more uh, problem uh, within amno but um how how that's going to to affect amno in the long term i don't think uh generally i don't think this will make amno uh weak in the sense of that going to make amno collapse i don't i don't think so uh, for me amno is already in in big in in big trouble i always use the term that i think amno still in coma after in 2018 it didn't really recovered yet uh, uh, and the symptom is still that they are Uh, in denial what is happening i think it's clearly there especially when we look at the, uh, what happened on on saturday uh, i think for 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 us a student of history and student of political science feel uh, that how amno didn't really reflect the sentiment of the people when talking about administration of justice court and others when they do believe that uh, leaders must interfere with the decision that leaders must play a role in to make sure that uh, amno get things uh, according to their 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 own way so this is where i, I think uh, where amno didn't really reflect the current sentiment of the voters and that in my point of view will will, will give impact on amno rather than what happened within within the, the leadership but at the same time uh to what extent this will uh, also impact on amno preparations towards the general election i think this issue and uh, especially another big uh, coming uh, decision on on uh, many uh, amno leaders and even on rosma manso on the 1st september will definitely uh, becoming a big issues in in campaigns against amno and using by by uh, uh, by ph or by pn or by by pass but to an extent that will benefit the opposition i doubt so i think uh, for the malays uh, i think ph obviously didn't uh, have a, a good uh, strategy yet uh, to gain more support uh, among among the malays and i think um, even among the amno uh, among among the malays i don't think this uh, strategy of amno where they they want to use this is sympathy towards a uh, uh, leadership of um, of malay leadership i don't think that's appeal to certain uh, to most of the voters malay voters uh, and large obviously i think for the amno this uh, hardcore it, it is it is working working for them all right so uh, i just want to uh, conclude my my point with with the very simple uh, observations yeah uh, i i do believe that uh, the next couple of weeks the next two weeks is very vital for amno if uh, rosma manso uh, 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 decision similar to her husband and also with zahid on the 15th of september face the similar situations of uh, uh, similar to najib i do believe amno will uh, will rattle a lot why because as i said just now this is where i think uh, never in their experience where the current sitting presidents are being sent to jail the former presidents uh, were, 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 were already served their time so with that i think that vacuum of leadership will give uh, a lot of uh, factions uh, a lot of fight in fighting uh, within amno that in my point of view will definitely jeopardize the 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 struggle of amno so with that you uh, i think I, i i i will reserve my comment more on the question and answer session thank you thank you thank you very much professor mudi those were uh, really good insights um So uh before I present the next speaker um I 
like to announce a big thank you to uh, uh, the viewer who has donated to us. Uh, we have just received a 100 ringgit donation. So thank you so much for your support for TLSTAH. We hope to host more webinars like this uh, in the future and uh, uh, many more to come. Yeah, so thank you very much. So if you would like to support us further, um, we have the uh, QR code on the right side of the screen and you can uh, scan it with uh, any e-wallet app that you have and uh, hope you can support us further. So yeah, thank you very much for watching us. And um, so uh, to continue the webinar, um, I'd like to present last but not least, uh, Professor Wong Ching Huat, uh, political scientist at Sanwei University. Uh, Professor Ching Huat, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Yi. Uh, thanks to Chinese Assembly Hall for having me. It's a privilege to share the panel with uh, Professor Gudiao and Professor Hamidin. Uh, I would have five points to make. Uh, the first, that uh, congratulations to Malaysia. Uh, for me, the imprisonment of Najib is the South Korean moment for Malaysia. South Korea holds the world records of sending the largest numbers of ex-government leaders to do. They have had four ex-presidents so far, and uh, the longest one has spent nearly three, five years in jail. And there's one, the last one is still serving uh, his term, expected to be uh, around 17 years. And uh, so Malaysia look is in two, uh, 1983. So after 39 years, we finally have something to say that we have learned from our Korean Sifu. So congratulations. Uh, second point, really come back to the main issue here, is that why this is a milestone? It's not just about winning, you know, uh, making it internationally to be on par with South Korea. But it really has an important message to what rule of law means in this country. When we talk about rule of law, uh, when we talk about equality before law, a lot of people in Malaysia would start to think and say, uh, would like to see, they, they, Malaysians would see it from a communal point of view. But they often forgot that ultimately we are talking about um, you know, if you are in the same situations, do you get the same treatment before law? That, that's a key point. And never before that, uh, than this MCO periods, that this idea, this rejection, this disgust on double standard in law enforcement had gained so much momentum or attention in Malaysian society, especially among the Malaysians. Because during the MCO, we seen we have seen in our own eyes that you have you have people from the elite group, Golongan uh, Kayangan in Bahasa Melayu, who get away with breaking rules and and you know, uh, while ordinary people, you get jailed. Now this is nothing new. It's it's, it's part of our political culture. It's always like a written, unwritten rule in Malaysian politics that if you are someone from the elite class, if you are willing to accept your defeat, uh, you can, you can get spared from humiliation. That was, that had been said about Anwar and that was, it, uh, implied that in the case of Harun, uh, in, in the seventies. So in, in the Najib case, when he finally went to jail, it, it is a cultural shock, I believe, to many people. Because it's sending a very clear message that you, you don't just get the Jew for stealing Patai or Milo. You get the Jews for stealing millions of dollars. Maybe that, you know, the, the time that you spend for stealing one million is much less than someone who steal a uh, 20 ringgit, but you get a deal. That, that's important. So the court decision is a resounding no to this dual dajat phenomenon. And that's very important for Malaysians 
psychological health because it makes us feel that, well, there is some rules in this country. It gets us to be less cynical. And my third point is that, however can this be turned around? So here we would perhaps, we can perhaps benefit from looking at South Korea. Since they, they provide us the example of sending ex-government uh, leaders to jail uh, over corruptions, over treason. So we perhaps can look at that. They sent three prime ministers, uh, three ex-presidents to jail. Uh, four ex-presidents to jail. Three of them have been acquitted. So at some point, you might have to expect to say, well, Najib would probably spend less than 12 years. First of all, if he behaved himself, he would uh, get cut. He would get to cut his due term by one third. So he probably would be out at, uh, after eight years anyway, for this case, for this case only. But that may come a bit earlier if, if he get a pardon. Now, in, in Korea, what are the considerations, what are the conditions for people to get pardoned? First of all, you have to have the reason that you are either advanced in age or you have health problem. So that makes a humanitarian, humanitarian ground for that to happen. But the, the, the fundamental justification, the political justification is that sometimes we need to pardon certain political elites for national reconciliation. In other words, that that guy might be a criminal, but he's a popular criminal. So if you keep him in jail, that half a, a segment of the people would remain unhappy. So in order to make them happier or less unhappy, we have to let them go out. So that's the second reason that you need to have this political reconciliation. Now, how do you get this political reconciliation? First thing, you need to apologize first. So all the three ex-presidents of South Korea who left jail earlier have all apologized in, on their, on their wrongdoings. So it's very clear cut. I'm sorry. So if I want to get out of jail, I must first of all admit that I'm sorry because a pardon while a criminal, a convict, is adamant that he is innocent would be a slap on the judiciary, on law, on the people. And this is something that Amno supporters out there, Najib supporters out there and Amno need to understand. If Najibs want to get out of jail early, you have to apologize and not defaming the court. That's how Political pardons work in the rest of the world. If you try to tell Yang Dipertuan Agung to pardon before Najib's even apologize for his crime, you are basically putting the royal institution in controversial position. And what is more interesting in the Korean case that tell us is that pardon for pardon, for political pardon to be justified on the ground of political reconciliation, it has to be done by your enemy. This is the case for the first two military ex-presidents, uh, John Do-hwan and Ro Tae-gu. They were pardoned by Kim Yong-san at the advice. Kim Yong-san was their successor but at the advice of the next president, Kim Dae-jo. And in the case of uh, Park Geun-hee, he, she was pardoned uh, by President Wood, her rival, who won the by-elections after her impeachment. So if Najib's want to go out, the most legitimate way is to wait for a non amno dominated government. That's the international rules of the game. Now, uh, but there is, of course, a different way that you can get out without going through uh, the path of pardon. 
especially when you think about Najib's case, he has not just one case, the SRC. He has four more cases, one involving SRC, one, one MDB, one on MDB audit uh, tampering, and uh, another one's on a uh, breach of trust. So we are looking at, uh, looking at different cases here. And if Najibs were to get a royal pardon for SRC, what happened to the four other cases? Is he going to be, is he going to come out as a free man, then walk into the court as the accused again on four other cases? And what if, if he gets convicted, are you going to get four more pardons? That's realistically a, a stupid question to ask if anyone thinking that uh, he can actually ask the king to pardon him for five times, right? So technically, he would have to wait until all the case settle. And so that he won off, we'll get the pardons for whatever case he get convicted in. But if this is what we have been thinking, we were reminded by the rally in Amno HQ over the weekend that this need not be the case. Why? Because Najib can actually get just one pardon for the SLCK and get a, get walk away from four other cases by way of a quitter. A quitter means basically the court say, there's no case against you, you now walk free. Now we have learned that in the case of uh, Riza, Najib's stepson, in the case of ex Saba Chief Minister uh, Musama, they walk free because the AG let them off. Now, if you wonder how this can be done, I'll give you a more interesting case. Uh, remember our ex Chief Spy, Madam Hassan. She was charged for criminal breach of trust, over 50 minutes ringgit. She was charged in 2018. Then the public the, the prosecutor at the Attorney General Chamber applied for a discharge not amounting to a quitter. What this means is that we stop our proceeding now but doesn't mean that she's completely free. We can charge her later. So we hold back. We, we, we press the pause button. But you don't leave the scene yet. You are not a free person. That happened in 2021. So what happened in 2022? After more than a year that no new charges were pressed against her, the court had to grant her a quitter. Now, that's a complicated way. But that's an easier way to get an acquitter by not having charges against you. Remember, Najib could have been charged in 2015 had the then Attorney General, Abdul Ghani Patan, got to do, got to press the charges. But he was sacked. Why could he be sacked? Because Attorney General served at the pressures of the young Dipron Agro, which really means at the pressures of Prime Minister, because retain, appointing or retaining an Attorney General is not one of the three matters that the King has <clears throat> discretionary power upon. So come back to this. The Amno Assembly, sorry, the Amno rally over the weekend just point to us that what could happen to Najib 
if you change, if you have a new general elections, you can have a new prime minister. With a new prime minister, you can appoint a new attorney general. Technically, they would, you could even have a new, uh, a new attorney general if Amno can press, can apply pressure effectively on Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri. But if Ismail Sabri did not want, does not want to bow to the pressure, then what they would do is to force an early elections. After the election, change the prime minister. With the prime, new prime minister, you change the attorney general. Then the attorney general can drop the case, as what we have seen in in uh, in Rizasis, in Musaman, in uh, in the roundabout way in Hassanas. Now, if that's happened, Najib would be free with four cases. Or if they want to be a little bit more dramatic, the prosecution just need to make some litigation mistake. To enable Najib's well-paid lawyers win the case and walk free in a technically legitimate way. So that's where you come back to say, is this milestone real? Are we seeing this excitement uh, that we become South Korea, but the next moments we probably get pushed back to some third world countries where um, corrupt national leaders just simply walk away because they are part of the Gorongan Kayangan. These are the people from the paradise. The normal law does not apply to them. Will we go on that way? How can we make sure that does not happen? Only way is not looking at the judges. Now, whenever we find corrupt leaders walk free, uh, many Malaysians would like to point the finger to the judges. No, you have to understand in cases where, when judges are dropped, finger should be pointed to the attorney general chambers, to the prosecutors. So how do we get that real milestone? That there is no more dual dacha on corruption. You steal Milo, you go to jail. You steal billions, you go to jail. We need fundamental reform. That is to split the Attorney General Chamber into two. To create out of it, the AGC, an independent public prosecution office so that the Attorney General would only function as the legal advisor of the government and that Attorney General could be appointed among the MPs, could even sit in the cabinet as minister. But he or she would have no control on prosecution because the chief prosecutor would have to be a an apolitical appointee so that ordinary people can count on and say, now, if you break the law, you face the same consequences. It doesn't make a difference if you are a criminal that is so powerful that can lead a party to win the next election and free yourself. That will happen. We need that. How do we get that? Two ways. One is that make sure that GE15 doesn't happen so soon. So we have still have 11 months to get this thing done. That in GE15, whatever outcome it is, we are telling people that no criminals can come back, can get, can walk free because they have the ability to install a new government and appoint a new attorney general. And second, if we can't help to have an early G15. Then the G15 should be a referendum, not on Najib, not on Jahid, but whether the main party, the main coalitions would promise and deliver the separations of the public prosecution office from the Attorney General Chamber. My last point, I probably would have spent quite a bit of time. Uh, the last point is that would an early GE15 
benefit UMNOs. Now, this is important because I know there are UMNOs members out there. They think that, okay, it might, it might be important to get uh, the rule of law, but not at the price of losing the next election. And they think that you really need to have an early election to ensure UMNO victory. We know that UMNO victory, early election, is very important for uh, Zahid because if it's late, and Zahid get convicted before the next general election, he would have to relinquish both his job as AMNO president and Barisa National Chairman. AMNO president would then go to his deputy, Muhammad Hassan, in the event of no party elections. But the Barisan chairman's job would likely go to Ismail Sabri. And then Ismail Sabri can control the candidate list. So that will change the game for Amnon. It's bad for Zahid to have a late G15. But would it serve Amno interest? My, my analysis is no. Why? Because we're going to have an early GE now. Amno will go into these elections divided between Zaid Gang and Ismail Gang. Everyone knows that given the situation, the toxic dynamics now in Amno, Ismail won't continue as prime minister. And so you would expect this election that Amno would face Amno would face uh, infighting sabotages in many better constituency. And given the situation now, it would help the opposition in one simple thing. Not that opposition can steal away Amno hardcore support. No. Amno support would still remain within Amno people including those warlords who fight against each other. But why would opposition benefit from this early election now? Is that given the case, the turnout would be high. Where the turnout is high, it would not be as high as 80%, 82% in, in, in uh, 2018, but it would be definitely higher than Johor 55%. Where the turnout is high, the opposition will get to retain many marginal seats. Amno won Johor, not because it has gained more seats. You look at the votes, Amno won almost double its, vote, its seats, but the total votes it won only increased by 17,000. 17,000. How could that marginal gain in votes translate into such increase in seats? The answer is, it's not just because that the old opposition votes were split between PH and PN, but more importantly, the opposition, opposition voters decreased by 170,000. In other words, voters who refuse to go to vote allow Amno to win. Now, but if Najib is going to be the case, this is going to draw the attention. Amno is helping the opposition by turning G15 into a rerun of G14. Now, it would not be exactly the rerun, but in any case, it's going to make Amno worse than taking the patience to fix the country and go into elections after next July. So if I'm UMNO members, if I really want UMNO to be free, I would go for a full term for Ismail Sabri. You can change him after that, but take this process to clean it up so that UMNO can walk into the elections with his head high there. Now this is important because if you look back at Korea, we start with Korea, so I end with Korea. All the ex-presidents who get sent to jail, who got sent to jail, were from the right-wing party. 
but the current president is still from the same party. How could the party have four ex Jew ex president still win? Because the right wing party never, never goes all out to slander judiciary. They accept the fact that sometimes if your leaders has made a mistake, you just have to live with that. You cut your damage. And that's something Amno need to do. If Amno can take this lesson, it'll be good for Amno. It'll be good for Malaysia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chin Huat. Uh, now we will enter the question and answer round. So uh, we have a few questions right here from our audience. So um, the first question, the first question, um, it's for Professor Hamidin. Um, so first question, as Najib was jailed, we saw there are a lot of Najib supporters requesting for his release. In your point of view, do you think this is because of a uh, cult of personality or are there some uh, political issues tied to it? If so, can you further explain? Thank you, Yi. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the question. I think it's a very uh, interesting question. I think it's a bit both. Uh, first, a uh, cult of personality within the AMNO. Uh, I think uh, for AMNO, as I said, uh, generally um, in the mind of, um, in the psyche of AMNO, I I don't think they, they, they accept what is happening yet. They didn't really grasp the reality what is happening uh, because of uh, in the case of, of Najib. Uh, because I think they think that, they, they always think that there are going to be uh, ways where their leaders will not be punished uh, by, 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 by the law. And, and uh, with that, uh, I think that's why uh, for me, for most of the AMNO leaders they are, uh, in, and members, they are still in denial of what is happening. And that's why I think the call for pardons becoming very uh, uh, loud within the AMNO uh, people. So that kind of personality, uh, call of personality definitely happened in AMNO. And um, in AMNO, the pedigree is, 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 is very important within that where Najib come from, the Raza uh, 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 family and 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 others. And at the same time, it, for the political, definitely uh, where I think I'm no one to use this as a as a as a running call for them to get support for the people, to get the sympathy uh, of the people towards uh, uh, towards Amno, uh, and especially to rally their own people. I think for Amno, one of the strategies that they, they really want why they want the elections uh, early as uh, Chen Huat mentioned just now what happened in, in Johor and in, in Malacca, for example, where AMNO managed to bring out their own voters to the to the polling because of the low, low turnout that will give advantage for them. So within within that framework of thinking, I think AMNO believe that the same formula can be used for the general elections. This is where they really want to rally their own troop to make sure that they are still within within Amno, but I'm I'm looking more on the psychic of the Amno uh, among among uh, Amno leaders where they they still cannot believe uh, this is what happened to their leaders. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Amidin. Uh, Professor Chihot, would you like to add anything? I think the fundamental questions here is that AMNO is very much uh, held at ransom by Najib. But this is a question of a matter of time because patronage networks works on the prospect of, of, of staying in power and the prospect of coming back to power if they have lost it. And with the with Najib in jail and Zahid in jail, if that happened, uh, those networks will not last. Mm. But what happened now is that they want to push the elections forward so that if they can install a new prime minister, they can, they can appoint new AG and they can drop all these charges. So that's what we are really seeing. And I think it's important for 
Malaysians who don't vote for UMNO to look at the whole picture very prudently. Mm. It's, it's very easy for you to say, well, you know, people who support UMNO, they're stupid, they have no information, and uh, they get cheated, and they have no morality, no shame. Now, that kind of accusations would make you happy, but it would not make this country better. You have to accept the fact that people have different interests. There are people who are very smart, who have a uh, certain moral value, would probably still feel that, say, uh, despite all the shortcomings of UMNO, I need to support UMNO because uh, my interests or my communal interests are at stake. And the way out for Malaysia is for UMNO to transform itself. It's not for UMNO to go down. Because if UMNO were to go down, that process would take some time for it to complete. And what worse is that you're going back then later with two uh, uh, coalitions of PH and BN fighting over any issues. Things are not going anywhere. But if UMNO were to transform itself, then we could have a chance that now, given a hung parliament, the parties would compete more rationally. So we need UMNO to change. And what is important now is UMNO is given time uh, for, for UMNO to undertake some changes. All, can, all parties that have governed for a long time are inevitable to have uh, some, if not many, corrupt leaders. That's a fact. And we need this country to move forward. We need UMNO to seize this golden opportunity to break with this corrupt past and start anew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, so um, next question. Uh, I, so next question will be to Dr. Gudiel. Um, how was it possible for Najib Rasak to bring in the use of a Queen's Council, the QC? Is it used before in the Malaysian judiciary? The short answer is that previously, when our bar, our lawyers were very young and new, the bar was very not young and new, and we were dealing with uh, quite complex issues uh, of constitutional and other commercial law, it was accepted that you can rely upon our colonial masters, as it were at that time, you know, who bequeathed to us that whole system, the English system of uh, uh, adjudication. And so previously, yes, um, the Bar Council also used not to object to the admission of Queen's Council in specific areas. But now our bar has matured. We have got lawyers, expert lawyers in every facet of the field. And that is why when um, the application, the last time a QC was admitted was about 20 years ago. A lawyer QC called Jeffrey Roberts uh, on a constitutional issue. And uh, at that time, the bar did not object to, its, to his admission. So it was admitted. But the most recent one, a few months ago, when Najib uh, wanted Jonathan Laidlaw, a QC, to be admitted, the Kuala Lumpur bar, because that's the state bar where, you know, uh, the, the issue is going to arise, as well as the bar council appointed lawyers, I was one of the lawyers, uh, to object to Jonathan Laidlaw on the ground that the issues that are being canvassed uh, are issues that our, our lawyers are able to handle with ease. And not only that, the law is substantially different in respect of uh, the penal code and AMLA and so on, because uh, our we have a specific penal code. Our law of evidence also in some areas is different. So he would not have to be, uh, there would be no benefit in uh, having him come in as Queen's Counsel. The objected, the court accepted the objection and therefore he did not come in. There was one other ground which we raised, which was, they were applying for the QC to come in at a very late stage, which means that all these thousands of documents would have to be then forwarded. Uh, to the I'm sorry, sometimes your audio went soft. For some oh, I'm reason. sorry. I'm sorry. I'll come nearer a bit. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So um, uh, 
also, you know, they had applied at such a very late stage. Uh, so all these thousands of documents, uh, and some of them are in Bahasa, Malaysia, would have to be translated, which means that this could have been, uh, this would have delayed the proceedings even further. Even our own local lawyer who took on the case after the change of uh, solicitors and counsel said he needed three, four months. What more of a foreign counsel uh, who is not conversant in the language, not conversant in the processes, this would have in fact taken even longer. So the court also took all these factors into account and said that, that they will not allow this QC uh, to come in on a special ad hoc decision for this case. And I think that was the right decision. And Najib did not appeal against that decision. So he was quite happy to accept that decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gurdia. Um, so third question, uh, this is for Professor Wong Chin Huat. Uh, in your point of view, how was the odds that, how are the odds that Amno uh, would become the government again in the upcoming general election 15? As we know, the AMNO had their internal meeting on uh, past Saturday. Uh, will this affect uh, Ismail Sabri and force him to dissolve the parliament earlier? Okay, I think uh, before the case of Najib, I've always said that um, there is a chance that AMNO may win uh, a simple majority by itself. But that would really require the turnout to be very low, 55 or even lower in the whole peninsula, because that would allow AMNO, uh, when every party fall back to their own hardcore supporters, then you would have then you would have um, AMNO, uh, the chance of winning uh, their, their strong seats and come close to about hundreds. And then with whatever they pick up from Sabah, they could have a simple majority government. Otherwise, if it doesn't go that far, I thought that uh, AMNO would still have a good chance to be the senior partner of a coalition government that you would expect, uh, GPS and GRS. Uh, now, that chance of AMNO would go down if the turnout rates get higher. That's what I... Have always been saying before the Najib case. So what happened with the Najib case, with the with the conclusion of the Najib case, is that the turnout is likely going to be higher, uh, not because, uh, uh, and and that's really it would be because of those who support opposition PH, they would think that their votes are actually have an impact of changing the country, their helplessness and hopelessness get reduced. Now that would raise their support and allow PH to maintain some seats. And some of the votes would actually come from people who never voted. Uh, but they probably would get emboldened that the fact even the most powerful person in this country can go to jail if you break the law. And they know this could happen only when people go out to vote. So that shift up no chances uh, uh, from dominating the government uh, lower this lower the chances the chances of Abner dominating the next government by allowing the opposition to go stronger, which means that the opposition may become a junior partner uh, in in the government. What I mean is like either PH or PN, or they may even become senior partner. More likely in the case of PH than PN. And one of the key factor is that. If the Malay uh, media ground voters, if they don't trust, they get disgusted with with, with Amnu. Uh, they don't trust PH. Would they go to PN? If they go to PN, then we win. Now, what we are talking about here doesn't really require a big turn of all these party coming, all these uh, opposition party coming together. That, that it doesn't need that to happen. All you need is just that uh, uh, in in multi corner fight, and sometimes when uh, the BN can be disadvantaged in, in multi corner fights. So it come back to that. There's a possibility of that. And now the situation, what I think is that you have an early election. Of course, the chance of a low turnout remains because if, let's say, uh, people who get excited uh, have not translated their excitement into willingness to vote, determination to vote, 
And so the turnout rate has not gone high enough, then Amno could still have a good chance to win, uh, not winning a simple majority on its own, but to win uh, a priority, the largest number of seats. So that's possible. But Amno faced with the challenge that I mentioned just now, that this election, it might be, it, it might suffer from infighting. It's so clear cut that with all what happened now, that Ismail Sabri would not likely to retain his position despite all this clash that he will make the poster boy. That's unlikely going to happen. So when that doesn't happen, uh, you would have people who try to sabotage uh, between those from who, who would be picked by the party leadership and those who are close, uh, who, who control some ministerial resources and so on. And it's bad news for Amno. Because when UMNO is split among themselves, uh, then they are unlikely to do well. So I think, uh, contrary to what other people think, I think going into the election next year, even though some people say the economic downturn whatsoever may actually um, hurt UMNO, I think on the other hand, it allows UMNO to be united because one with all these court cases set up, uh, patronage, would bring Amnus united again. And that would actually make it tougher uh, for, for the opposition. Yeah, thank you, Professor Chin Uh So as a small follow-up uh, to this question, uh, Professor Hamidin, would you like to add more? Because uh, I remember you mentioned uh, also Amno having this internal power struggle. So uh, is there... Uh, any uh, chance of Amno reconciling this power struggle? I think uh, I agree with uh, Prof Chin Huat that I think uh, one of the biggest challenge for Amno is very much the internal uh, fighting that they're having. And looking at the current situation, I don't see any uh, moving towards the reconciliation between the two. Uh, where I think obviously uh, Ismail Sabri uh, look like want to delay the, the election while Amno uh, leadership, especially the MKT and Zahid, uh, want to be called as soon as possible. With that, obviously, uh, I think we we'll give a lot more tussle within uh, within Amno. But to to an extent that will give benefit to the to the opposition, I I don't think so. I I, I doubt that will give. A, very much a benefit to uh, to the uh, opposition. However, I think what's happening now, the court cases uh, definitely will stimulate a lot more people towards going to the uh, uh, to the uh, to come out during the um, uh, in to to vote. Uh, but to what extent that will reach. Um, a good numbers or percentage, maybe around 70 to 80 percent. I, I doubt so. Looking at the current uh, political uh, situation and, and the fatigue in terms of the economy and, and, and others. And obviously, I think for people uh, generally, uh, it seems that people are more concerned, more uh, concerned on their uh, daily life, bread and butter issues. Uh, in fact, if we talk to general uh, uh, members of AMNO, uh, most of them didn't want elections. Uh, I noticed that the one that really go for elections within Amno is very much on their leadership level, even in Bahagian or at the central level that want election to, to, to happen. But to an extent, uh, uh, this will create a um, uh, fraction within Amno. I think uh, looking at the current situation, the fraction between Putrajaya uh, and, and, and court uh, cluster in, in Amno, I think it is going to happen soon. Uh, uh, the, the, the fracture will become becoming more and more apparent, and that, in my point of view, will give problem for Amno in terms of that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Midi. Uh, so the next question, uh, this is uh, this is uh, for all speakers. Uh, if Najib really is, if Najib is released, will we have another constitutional crisis, uh, like a revenge on the judges? Uh, like Tun, Tun Saleh Abbas. Um, so uh, would Dr. Gurdia like to answer this question? Uh, 
I think the short answer is that uh, it's not so easy to remove judges. Judges have security of tenure. They can only be removed for very specific causes, like uh, if they uh, breach the their code of ethics in a in a big way. Uh, you know, their body becomes infirm. In other words, they become sick or some other ground. So, especially in this day and age, Tun Saleh Abbas issue, I think, cannot be repeated. Uh, and there is no basis to remove the judges. You've got to show grounds under Article 125, bracket 3, sub-Article 3 of the Federal Constitution. You must then set up a tribunal. And then the tribunal will have to decide whether or not there is a adequate, there is a proper ground for removal. So the short answer, therefore, is that even if the government of the day wants to seek revenge, there are pr protection and procedures which protects the security of tenure of judges, especially if all that they have done is to abide by their oath of office, decide cases in the way that uh, they think is just, and they've come out with their grounds, which is in a very transparent way. So the short answer is that even if someone wants to seek revenge, it's not so easy and it will likely fail quite miserably. Thank you, Dr. Gudia. Uh, Professor Chihuat, uh, would you like to add anything? Uh, can't, uh, can't, we can't hear you. Um, I say Professor Gudia answered so well, I don't think I can add any more oh. value to his answer. But thank you, thank you, Professor Chihuat. Uh, and Professor Hamidi? No, I think I, I'm, I'm okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and the uh, last and final question of the evening. Uh, did, did the boss school uh, effect, will it still become a hot topic in the upcoming election? What is the impact of boss school for the general election 15? Uh, Professor Chin Huat, uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that it would uh, remain this. And funnily enough, uh, in 20, 2018, UMNO could not avoid it. Mm. But now by rallying behind UMNO, uh, rallying behind Najib, UMNO is tying itself uh, to otherwise, you could have a G15 that is different. And to, to bring Najib back, uh, I'm really not sure how many ordinary Malay voters would 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 actually come out to vote for Najib. Mm -hmm. Okay, there probably would be a sizable amongst UMNO members. But what about non-UMNO UMNO members? But it certainly would help PH and PN to drive their supporters. Mm -hmm. And it depends on how this is being framed. If it's being framed on Najib alone, that it probably wouldn't get so bad because this round. Uh, Rosma has lied low as compared to last time when she was the first lady. But if this is framed as if like, would Malaysia, should Malaysia tolerate Dua Daja? Ultimately, uh, when, when the questions of when Amno say, uh, you know, we want to, uh, we, we want these pardons and we want to change AGs and so on, it would, you, you can only think about that question would it come to the point that we have two classes of criminals? Criminals who can win elections and install prime minister, appoint new AGs and get themselves free, and criminals who cannot. I think Malaysian society would have low tolerance of that. And unfortunately, if Abnu get punished for taking such a position, it would be bad not only for Abnu. But as always say, it's bad for Malaysia as well. But like it or not, UMNO represents an uh, important constituency in the Malaysian society. Thank you very much, Professor Ching Huat. Uh, would the other two speakers like to add anything? Yeah, I, I think I, 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 I want to add a bit on, on to an extent that will benefit uh, UMNO if, if uh, Najib uh, or Bosco becoming big. Uh, again, in, in uh, uh, um, PRU 15, looking at the pattern of the voters in Malacca and in Johor, 
uh, Bosku or Najib really did manage to bring the hype into the campaign, but it didn't turn it didn't turn out into votes. Vote wise, nothing much happened, even among the the the, the people who vote for Amno. So with that, I I doubt that bringing up Najib as as a maybe as a as a topic for Amno will benefit them in 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 that in in that sense. Obviously, they're going to use that uh, to gain sympathy. But among uh, as uh, Tian Huat uh, uh, point out just now, just that's very much among themselves. Uh, so I don't think that will appeal to even bigger uh, 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 voters uh, outside of of Amno. But I think. I'm I'm interesting now looking at how particularly uh, pass uh, and PN especially pass to what extent pass machinery will go and, and really hammer the issues of Najib LCS to the rural Malay. I think that will very much determine uh, what's going to happen uh, for Amno in the next general elections. I think uh, looking at the current situations, uh, past leaders are, are quite open now, attacking Amno in regard to what happened uh, to to Najib. So with that, to what extent, um, past will get together with Muhyiddin and bring a, a good narrative against Bosco. I think that will make a more uh, interesting point within the Malay community, especially in the rural area where Amno always be the strong. Uh, uh, presence there. So with that, uh, I think interesting to see how the combination between past and to an extent, Basatu can swing some of the voters uh, to towards towards PN. I think that will be make, make uh, things more interesting to, uh, when we analyze the Malay votes in the uh, PRU 15. But I doubt uh, Najib uh, if BN decide to use Najib as a main strategy that will benefit them in the uh, in the PRU 15. Thank you very much, Professor Amidi. Um, so uh, that concludes uh, the end of our Q&A session. Uh, I would like to invite uh, each of the speakers to make a, to give a small wrap up. And so uh, Dr. Guria, would you like to go first? Yes, I just have a very short uh, comment to make and that is this. I think there's a lot of excitement in uh, political parties and others, both sides, uh, with regard to the outcome of the court case. And both people are positioning themselves, you know, asking for pardon, asking for condemning the court decision, asking for removal of the CJ and so on and so forth. But I think this is only to be expected after a very intensely fought sort of a, a fight that went on for four years. Um, but I think once the reality sinks in, mm. then the reality will slowly people will come to terms with the fact that this is here to stay. It's not such a given that, you know, you make noise, uh, that they, it'll change the course of events. It will not change the course of events. Even if you look at those people who have been pardoned, for example, there were many, they served many, many years in prison. That includes Anwar Ibrahim includes uh, Harun Idris, it includes Mokta Hashem, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So once the reality sinks in and people get on to their ways of life and to deal with the reality of the political scenario at that time and their immediate concerns, I think there will be a cooling off and this whole euphoria surrounding the fact that we got to save our Bosco, I think in my respectful view, I think this will subside considerably. And I think then we are back on an even keel and the idea of preserving the institution of the judiciary will become critically important. Thank you very much for listening to the participants and for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Kudia. Uh, next, I would like to invite Professor Amidin to make a small conclusion. I think uh, it's, it's going to be very interesting to understand uh, looking uh, at, at uh, Najib uh, episodes. Uh, first, I think to 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 really uh, is a good watershed for our country where there is a, uh, a rule of law that's governed the country. I think and it's equal in nice to everybody. I think this is where uh, I totally agree with Professor Goodyear just now. 
yes, now uh, you can see that Amno react in, in, in such a manner. Uh, I think they're still in denial what's happened to them. Uh, when, when reality bites, I think slowly uh, they will have to face uh, what uh, what consequences that uh, that uh, what it did, but uh, how this is going to impact um, um, Malaysian politics, especially uh, Malay politics? I think it will be very interesting to see uh, why. Uh, I think especially uh, among uh, within within the Malay community, uh, I think this will be uh, very much uh, a benchmark uh, looking at the type of leadership that are going to emerge in the future. And then hopefully this will be a very good uh, lesson for, for the Malay uh, political party uh, and, and for Malay politician uh, at the same time. So with that, uh, I do believe that Najib's uh, episode is, is very important, not only in terms of legal, but in terms of the political culture in Malaysia. Uh, for example, uh, we always say that uh, it, it is a very uh, saddening when we, uh, when we look at the, the phenomena of Bosco where kind of um, uh, give uh, uh, promoting a different uh, or, or wrong set of values to 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 the people so with this i think uh, hopefully that we 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 get back the, the moral ground to make sure that we are in the right track when it comes to the political behavior in the in the country thank you very much thank you very much professor amidi uh professor chihot thank you Yi. uh in, in two days' time, we're going to celebrate the 65th anniversary of uh, Malaya independence. And in uh, less than three weeks' time, the 59th anniversaries of Malaysia formations. It's in this, at this uh, August uh, occasion, we should really ask ourselves, what do we mean by independence? For me, independence is that we all become free, that we are the master of our own destiny. And in politics, that translates into that the citizen decides the country's future and they are subject. They're governed by the set of law that is applied equally on everyone. In that sense, this, uh, we have we have had many corrupt leaders, but to have uh, one of the highest status an ex-prime minister going to do is to send a clear message that our system can say no to do a Dutch act. You can still, you still milotin or uh, Patai, you go to jail, you still billions of dollars, you go to jail. And you, you, you can afford, you can be so rich that you change lawyers like you change your shirts every day. You still go to jail. But to make sure that this achievement is secure, we need to, we need more than in judiciary independence. We need an AG chamber that is, uh, that we need a public prosecution that is free from political interference. And that can only be done by splitting the AG chamber into two. And we need to demand all political parties to do this. We need to demand Prime Minister Ismail Sabri to promise to the people if he really believes in uh, upholding the separations of power, he must pursue uh, agency reform. And we must stand by him. Now, if However, if G15 comes first, then we as voters have the duty to make AGC res, uh, reform one of the key issues because it's ultimately about dual dajat. Dual dajat between criminals, those who can win elections and change uh, a, a point friendly attorney generals to free themselves, and those who cannot. There should be only one Dajat for all criminals. They go to jail if they are found guilty and deserving of jail terms by the court. When we have that day, this country would be more meaningful in celebrating her independence. Medeka, Samat Medeka.
Thank you very much, Professor Chinwat. Uh, so I would like to conclude this talk. Uh, this is the, we come to the end. Uh, thank you once again to three of our very esteemed speakers. Uh, they have given us very valuable insights uh, to, as to how uh, it would turn out for the future of our country. And um, I would like to thank them once again for your time. Uh, Professor Wang Xinhua, Dr. Kudia, and Professor Hamidin, thank you very much for uh, uh, giving this talk. And uh, also a big thank you to all the viewers out there and especially to our media partner, Kini TV. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us this evening and we hope you have a good evening and uh, enjoy uh, Hari Medeka. Selamat Hari Medeka. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Selamat Hari Medeka. Selamat Hari Medeka. And Selamat Hari Malaysia too. <laughs>